Welcome to Trendlines Over Headlines, the show where we break down the markets with some of the best traders and analysts in the world. We've got a good one for you today. Ryan Dietrich is joining us. Ryan is the chief market strategist at Carson Group. He's one of the best statisticians out there, and he's regularly quoted in just about every major financial publication, so I'm really excited to hear his take. As a reminder, this is for educational purposes only. Nothing Ryan or I say here should be taken as financial advice. Anyways, before we talk to Ryan, it's Friday, the markets are closed, so let's go take a look at the charts. All right, so the NASDAQ outperformed, gaining a little over 2%, while the Dow actually closed lower on the week, but only by about 10 basis points, so more or less flat for the Dow. Uh, taking a look at the S&P 500, it rose about a third of a percent this week. The rallies kind of started losing steam as we test resistance from those Q1 lows. All eyes seem to be on that 4100, 4200 level, so that's definitely going to be an important one to watch next week. Now, moving on to the sectors of the S&P 500, six of the 11 sectors closed higher. Tech led gaining about 2%. Energy lagged by a wide margin, dropping nearly 7% thanks to the weakness in crude oil. Uh, crude broke a pretty important level around 94 this week, so we could continue to see energy correct in the coming weeks. Now, anyways, my guest Ryan Dietrich brought a ton of fascinating stats about the current market environment, so let's talk to Ryan. All right, Ryan, it's great to see you, and thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, Patrick, I'm, I'm honored to be here. There's uh, plenty of stuff to talk about, and uh, we're going to have some fun, too. Yeah, and congratulations on the new gig. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, working for Carson Group, one of the largest RAs in the country, and also one of the fastest growing financial institutions in the country. So it's um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We can do a lot of the same similar things that I've done done before, um, you know, like coming on with you and, and talking markets, but I'm just thrilled to be part of a, a really awesome team and can't wait to see uh, what we all create and do, uh, do in the future. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah, well, we wish you the best of luck. Is this your first interview with the new firm and your new role? You know what? It might. Be, I've talked to some reporters on the phone, so let's just say yes. This is all my right. first live um, interview, if you will. So exclusive. I wouldn't want it to be anywhere else. Chart reports <laughs> awesome. So that's that's that that I'm happy with this. <laughs> all right. Well, you know I'm a huge fan of your stats, uh, and I know you've brought a bunch for us. Um, but I want to start off with kind of the bigger picture ones, and we can kind of get more granular yep. as we go. Um, so let's start off with the presidential cycle. You know, we're in a midterm election, midterm year, uh, which has historically been the weakest of uh, weakest year of the four year presidential cycle. Um, and you get labeled a permable sometimes. I don't, I don't know if you knew that, but um, but I think it's unfair, honestly, because at the beginning of this year, uh, you were very vocal at the fact that midterm election years like um or I'm sorry, midterm years like 2022 tend to be the weakest of uh, the four-year presidential cycle. And you were very vocal about the fact that 2022 was likely going to be a lot more challenging than 2021 was. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just kind of, for those who don't know about the presidential cycle, maybe just talk about it and why it's something that's that you look at. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the... Did I think, you know, we'd have one of the worst starts to a year in 50 years for stocks? No. Did I see the worst year for bonds since 1840? No. But you know, these are some things that, that I, we've been talking about for a while. And you think about it, the first year the new president comes in, maybe things do okay. By that second year, usually you hit some bumps in the road, right? The uncertainty of that midterm election that's coming. And I, I get it. You know, every year is different. There's always different scenarios out there. But, you know, it's kind of one of those it is what it is you look at it here and, and what we've been talking about is you know these quarters this year first quarter second quarter third quarter are like the worst quarters out of 16 out of a four-year presidential cycle there's 16 quarters literally the second quarter is the worst quarter out of all of them we just lost 16 percent in the second quarter this year so again you know <laughs> there's some black swans and some things we didn't see coming but it sure is interesting to me patrick that some of this weakness that was anticipated not this i think it'd be this week but some potential rockiness and, and, and weakness it's playing out and the good news if you look to the right some pretty good quarters are coming up 
Yeah, so you're, you're saying that Q2, it looks like it's the only negative quarter in, in those 16 uh, quarters within the presidential cycle. Um, is, is that right, Q2? Yeah, it, it, that is correct. It is the only one negative. The third one, third quarter where we are right now is barely positive, as you can see there. But second quarter, and I guess when I update this chart at the end of the year, that second quarter is going to go down even a little bit more, right, after just losing 16%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when, when I think of the presidential cycle, this is uh, this one comes from uh, Ned Davis Research. Yeah. It's one of my favorite charts out there. Um, and you can clearly see uh, how the Dow does in those four years of the presidential cycle. You know, not so great in those first two years, but it really picks up in year three and, and also year four. And then that orange line below is liquidity. And you can kind of see how liquidity is driving that. And, you know, I don't know why that is. Maybe the sitting president does everything in their power to get reelected. Who knows why? But man, that is, that's a trend that's pretty undeniable, right? Yeah, you're going to get me in trouble talking politics here, but I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Ned Davis, you know, Ed and the team, the stuff they put together. This chart, it's kind of, it makes sense, right? The first year, second year, maybe it's new policies, some bumps in the road. Then by that third year, you start to, you know, get things going again, right? Nobody really wants to have a recession right ahead of an election. Historically, if there's a recession ahead of an election, you're going to lose, right? That's what we've seen throughout history, and politicians know that. So again, there's certain levers or certain things Congress can pull to kind of get things going, get voters in a good mood. And hey, if their 401k is a little bit higher, they're probably going to be a better mood. The economy is growing, going to be a better mood. So, you know, there's there's likely some something to this. And again, it's similar to the chart we just showed where, you know, we're getting into some of those really good quarters coming forward. And that's when um, the liquidity can potentially um, start to uh, pick it up a little bit. Yeah. And uh, th this next one's interesting because, you know, on top of those first two years of the presidential cycle being bad. It's even worse, um, according to this chart, when there's a new president in office. Is that right? That's exactly right. And it's funny because I made I made this chart, and I guess I should remember I made the chart. You actually reached out to me and said, "Hey, you want to talk about this chart?" And I looked, and I go, "That's a pretty good chart." And I actually had to go back and find <laughs> when I made it, and I updated it. And it's true. I mean, when you have a new president, and again, it's kind of you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? If you have the same president, you kind of know what you're in, whether you like him or you don't. You know what's likely going to happen. When you have a new president, maybe that's not always the case because you don't really know him yet. Now, I will say the first year of a new presidency is usually fairly weak. President Biden, congratulations, he had a huge first year, right, last year, stocks up nearly 30%. And that was actually the best first year for a new president since the first George Bush, George Bush number one, so like late 80s or so. So so just something to think of. But I think now we're in that second year, these themes that we've kind of been talking about, the second year of a new president, you can see it there. That's by far the smallest, uh, you know, smallest column that's higher. And and it's, that's what's playing out, right? With stocks still down, you know, fairly significantly so far this year. Um, it's, and again, the good Good news again check it out go to the right a new president that third year is when things tend to bounce back so we've had the negative part we'll have to come back in 18 months or so but hopefully we're going to have that better part here when you get to that third year of the, of the new uh, new president yeah you know I, I i'm noticing a common theme in all these stats that you've brought today and not to give any spoilers away but the common theme is that we're kind of in the eye of the storm in all these cycles, meaning kind of the weakest part of not just the presidential cycle, but also, you know, the annual uh, seasonal cycle. We're kind of in a, a tricky spot there. So it's kind of like we're in the eye of the storm. But the good news uh, is in a lot of these stats that, you know, once we move past a couple months out, things start to look a little bit better. Is that right? No, that's, that's exactly right. And again, I mean, I know you have a lot of technicians that come on here and I, I do have a CMT, but I'm kind of more of a big macro strategist anymore. So I like these bigger picture views to kind of help, you know, the longer, I like to tell stories and show the longer term point of view on a lot of things. And, and, and again, the longer term, yes, stocks usually go up three out of every four years. We, we, we know that, but again, some of these other things that we're hopefully laying out do suggest that, you know, it's been a really rough year, but there could be some pretty good opportunities here. I mean, you know, um, let's see here, you know what? Well, and you lose 15% for a quarter like we just did. I don't do I think do we talk about that? I think we got that coming up. But you know, a year later, where is that? The 15% for a quarter. Did we do that one? Yeah, I mean, here we go. Yeah. So we just had a terrible quarter. And I'm, if I'm bouncing around, sorry. We just had a terrible quarter, but check it out. I mean, you know, when you lose that much in a quarter, six months to a year later, SP's never been lower, right? And you and, got some and, pretty significant performance there. Now that 
that uh, down 15% quarter, that was also in Q2, right? The, right. the weakest and the only negative quarter yes. historically in that presidential cycle, right? So, it, I mean, that's, exactly. again, it's in line, right? That's exactly right. And again, it, it sure felt pretty bad for investors, you know, you know, getting your statements and, oh, by the way, bonds didn't really perform all that well in the second quarter either, as we know. So, you know, it was rough, but but still to be aware and to kind of have a have a look at history, it, you know what, I used it before, we've heard it all a thousand times, Mark Twain said history didn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. I love saying that. And I think there's something there. And, and this again, you know, we'll see, right? We'll see. But again, it would say really rough quarters be open to some strength. And let's be honest, since the quarter ended, like you said, we're up almost double digits or maybe a tad over double digits so far in this new quarter. So we are, <laughs> we're living up to those uh, higher returns after a bad quarter. Yeah. I mean, so, so you kind of were, uh, brought me to my next point here, which is this chart, because, you know, yes, we're in a historically weak quarter. Q3 is on average the weakest quarter. Uh, but like you said, we're off to a great start. July was the best month in nearly two years. Uh, yep. I think we gained, what, 9% uh, roughly in July. Right. Um, but it looks here like it's not so much July you have to worry about in Q3. It's more August and September. Is that right? That's exactly right. And it's one of those things, again, you knew coming into the year that usually August and September can be potentially troublesome areas. And that's what it shows. We broke it down by 1950, last 10 years, 20 years, um, you know, uh, uh, midterm years. And again, it's kind of one of those, again, it is what it is. We're in that area where you can potentially stub your toe a little bit. Also, after that nice big rally that we had, um, you know, maybe there could be some back and fill uh, that can play out. I know we got another chart about midterm years. Midterm years tend to bottom, honestly, later in the year. Um, so that's that's just something to be uh, be aware of. I think it's really interesting because as bad as this year has been, uh, when you look at it in the context of a midterm year, when you compare it to other midterm years, it actually looks pretty par for the course, right? It's crazy as it might sound. Yes. Now that this much weakness to start the year, not quite as normal, but midterm years are rough. I mean, remember 2018, right? When the Fed did one more interest rate hike right around Christmas time, we had that huge, almost bear market into um, you know, the Christmas Eve holiday. And then, then the Fed kind of did the pivot later and we're off to the races in 2019. But what I'm getting at, midterm years tend to be rough. And what got, what got me on this one is when we had that big sell-off early, we had a little bit of a bounce. Look at it like, you know, could we really have made a low for the year in March? You know, history would say midterm years tend to be later. You see it there on the screen. You know, August is the av middle of August is the average uh, midterm year low. September is your median low. So we said, ah, probably not. And sure enough, now we have another big whoosh lower. But I'll tell you, June 16th is looking like a pretty legit low, in my opinion. I think that better than average chance that is the low for the year. But I feel a lot better about a June 16th low in a midterm year than a March low in a midterm year. And that's just another one of those th reasons. I think it kind of pays to look at history. Yeah, I think that's really interesting how you kind of found the average date of the low um, and it falls right around kind of where we are now. Yeah. Um, but like you said, you know, uh, June 16th low, not too far off. Yeah. Um, the, the, the final thing on this is, you know, 17% peak to trough correction. Obviously, we had more of that this year, but that's your average midterm year, the largest correction out of a four year presidential cycle. What I think matters to investors and people listening. From those lows, you see it there, stocks have been higher every time a year later back to 1950. Now, again, no one knows what the lows are. I'm fully aware. We don't know if June 16th is the lows or not. We'll know at the end of the year, but it might be. And history would say, if you're willing to hold, like those earlier charts I shared, off those lows, you tend to be rewarded. And so far, we've been pretty rewarded since June 16th. Yeah, you know, so... August, September seasonality, a little rocky, but you have a bunch of um, bullish stats that, that have kind of occurred just recently. So why don't you walk this one, uh, walk us through this one. So we had a bunch of bread thrusts yeah. last week, but this is kind of like a momentum thrust, right? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I just want to, you know, say thanks again for having me on, you know, the chart report. I mean, I love all the stuff you guys do because I'm busy in meetings and if you're running around and you just look and I see all the really smart people that pointed out, you know, 55% of the S&P 500 made a three week high and how that historically is a pretty strong breath thrust. Yeah, it didn't work a couple times, but normally that's a sign and you can add this to it, right? In a bear market, you're going to get spectacular gains. We can go back and look, look at 2008. I mean, some of the largest historical gains ever took place in 2008, one day gains, I should say, but that's what happens. But when you have three straight days, of at least a 1% rally. That's really rare. I'm sharing it on the screen here. I got the last 10 times it happened going back about 20 years. You go out a year, 
Stocks have never been lower. And I get it. Stocks are normally higher. I understand that. But what I what I think happens is at the end of bear markets, you get this buying thrust when you couple it with 55% of the stocks in the S&P make it a three-week high with some of the other things, the improvement in stocks above the 50-day moving average, 200-day moving average. We're seeing some signs that are consistent with a pretty major market low. And again, a year later, stocks are usually higher. And the last thing on this one, I remember when this happened around the election, right? The election um, in 2020, it happened and it, it kind of signaled, they had actually like four days in a row back then, it, four days of 1% gain. And it was around an event. And then this thing happens and then the market rallies and we're talking about it then, it could be bullish and it sure was in 2021. And now we had another one around the Fed. And let's not, I'm going to use the F word here, fundamentals in the Fed, just for a minute. I don't like talking charts, but you know, everyone's talking Talk about the Fed, the Fed, the Fed. What have we seen this year when the Fed hiked rates? It hiked rates a couple times, a rally initially, and that second day is a face plant. We're talking three, four percent drops, right? Now all of a sudden something different happened. The market, whatever Not the, the case Fed said, is what the yeah. Fed said. We rallied after the Fed, and that's a good sign. Now, did you point out? Did I see you on Twitter say that that was like one of the best uh, reactions post Fed in in some time? What did you say? Yeah, yeah, I think I did say that. Actually, I say a lot on Twitter. No, it's true. I look because we had like two days in a row of a huge rally, like four percent or something after after like two days of the after the Fed. I'm like that's a pretty big rally. And I looked and going back to like 1970, I had Bloomberg data back to 1970. This was the best reaction after two days after a Fed hike since 1970. So it's pretty legit data. So again, the market's getting comfortable. Whatever the Fed said, the Fed said market's getting comfortable uh, with Fed policy. In my opinion, when I see something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really kind of alternative bread thrust. You know, we see all sorts of other bread yeah. thrusts, but I'll still call this a bread thrust. Or I'm sorry, momentum thrust. I like yeah. that term better. Um, anyway, let's let's end with this one. So uh, this one looks at non-recessionary bear markets. And at this point, we're not officially in a, a recession yet. I know that's kind of a controversial topic. Yeah. Uh, and you have actually some good charts on that topic. But why don't you walk us through this one right here? Yeah, well, before I do that, though, I am in my game room. I'm sure you want to see me take a shot. So, Patrick, I'm going to do it right now. Okay, so I'm going to throw this backward. You ready? Let's can see you, what you got. Let's see what you got. Can you, see, you, see, you, see the rim? you move it just a tad here? You see the rim better like that, probably? Here we go. All right, here we go. Did it go in? Oh, man. I don't, I I don't know. I didn't. I missed it. I think I missed. I missed. Whatever. <laughs> I, I gave I gave you a college try. I thought you guys want to see me shoot one backwards. But hey, what was the question? I have no idea. Let's see here. Um, oh, bear markets. Here we go. I was all yeah, excited yeah. about shooting a basket. Well, there. so you said this this bear market looks normal, and yeah. and you know, to your average person at home, this is probably the worst thing they've uh, <laughs> they maybe have experienced, right? So, what do you mean by yeah. that? No, I, I, well, I would agree. I mean, it, it feels pretty bad to the most investors, but I think that's why it's important to take a look. So again, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? You could talk to 10 people, get 10 answers. I, I don't think we're in a recession when the jobs market is this strong. We still have earnings that are, that are improving. Industrial production has been strong. We can get in all that. I don't think we're in a recession. And when you take a look at history, you could have a bear market without a recession. I mean, it, it happens. It's happened before, and it's probably going to happen again. So what I'm sharing on the screen here, your average bear market without a recession pulls back right about 24%. We just pulled back right about 24%. And again, is it, is it that easy, that perfect? Well, maybe not. But again, this is something, again, that I was talking about a lot, saying, hey, you know, this is that range. Once you get down over 20%, it's very rare to have a bear market get much worse if you're not in a recession. Yeah, 87, you pull back more. That was a little different. But that's kind of that area where, boy, oh, boy, if you're, you're optimistic about the future, maybe now's the time to uh, consider adding. And that is exactly what's played out so far. It's kind of amazing how it works out time and time again. Yeah. I mean, anyways, I, I think we got to wrap it up now, but I mean, these, these are awesome stats and uh, thank you again for coming on. No, my pleasure. Again, I've been a fan of you guys. How long have you been doing the chart report? A couple of years now? Uh, about about three years now. Yeah. Yeah. I know you do. I know you cracked 20,000 Twitter followers. I think you were like right there. And I, I said, ah, who wants to be a 20? And I tried to push you over 20 and you guys are way I, you over did. 20 now. You did actually. So, and, no, and I've been a fan. push. Yeah, I've been yeah. a fan as long as you've been doing it, and congratulations on the success. And I'm just honored uh, to be here talking charts with you. And hopefully, we get to, honestly. I said we should have called this tables over over uh, headlines. <laughs> I, I bring tables, not charts, but whatever you want to call it. This was this was fun, and thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I hope you come back sometime. Absolutely. Awesome. Have a great weekend. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to click like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks.